Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start with our second session of the day. If we can ask everyone to come back and um, the grab your cup of coffee. Um, good morning. My name is Scott Kratz. I'm the Vice President for Education here at the museum. And a couple quick announcements before we begin this next session. Um, the first, our hashtag um, that we've been tweeting about um, the, and uh, had some really wonderful discussion this morning during our first opening panel uh, is iCities. So the hashtag for our Twitter is iCities. Um, and we'll be getting a couple questions too about Wi-Fi. Um, when you uh, look for the Intelligent Cities Wi-Fi and the uh, username is NBM, lowercase as in National Building Museum, and the password is exactly the same, NBM. So this morning, um, we talked about, uh, in this opening session, really big ideas of, of what makes an intelligent city. And in the second session this morning, we're going to drill down a little bit more and talk about uh, the practical uses of technology and data in cities and municipalities. And we have a fantastic panel uh, to kick off that discussion. Um, our moderator uh, this morning will be Greg Lindsay, who's a journalist and author of Aerotropolis, The Way We'll Live Next, which just happens to be for sale in the museum shop. Uh, we have Mark Cleverly, the Director of Strategy from uh, Global Government Industry, IBM Corporation. Nick Grossman, Director of Civil Work, Civic Works for Open Plans. And finally, Dustin Hazler, the Director of Government Innovation for Spigot and former CIO of Manor, Texas. Greg's going to lead us through a discussion, and then in about 45 minutes, he'll start taking questions uh, via Twitter and via um, the, our Intelligent Cities Tumblr, as well as start queuing people up. Um, please the, give a warm round of applause to our second panel of the day. Thank you, Scott, and thank you all for coming again. Appreciate, we all appreciate it. Um, the title of this, uh, of this session, The City is a Lab, uh, is taken in part from a, a, a document, a report you'll find in all of your packets called A Planet of Civic Laboratories. It was commissioned by the Rockefeller Foundation and executed by the Institute for the Future. Um, inside is a sort of great, uh, great capsule discussion of, of the challenges of, of implementing uh, an intelligent city. Um, as, as they put it, battle lines are being drawn over the future of the smart city. Battle lines, as the Rockefeller Foundation puts it, between uh, the large technology giants, such as Big Blue, of course, uh, and Cisco and HP and others, um, that have aggressively sort of moved into the notion of building intelligent cities and, and are offering to some extent what they term as a smart city in a box. Um, the sort of notion that one size fits all, that all solutions are scalable, and that, uh, you know, that experts can tell you how to implement an intelligent city. Um, and then the flip side of this argument is coming from what they describe as sort of the hacktivist camp, which is, uh, you know, grassroots technologists advocating, bo you know, bottom-up technologies, open source solutions, and very sort of lightweight answers using off-the-shelf parts to implement a, a more equitable, intelligent city. Um, and the Rockefeller Foundation concludes smartly, I think, uh, that neither approach uh, is, is sustainable on its own, that basically we must reconcile these two together, the powerful infrastructure and resources of America's technology companies, along with the sort of, you know, grassroots open architectures and initiatives of, of groups like, um, you know, like uh, Code for America and, uh, and C Click Fix, for example, um, and really sort of reconcile these two. Um, and so I think we have a fantastic panel for this, where we have a representative of, of Big Blue, of, of, of Big Tech, uh, a representative of the grassroots, and in, in, uh, in Nick Grossman as well, and then Dustin, uh, who has, uh, who's in the private sector now, but is a CIO for, for Manor, Texas, really had to sort of grapple with these issues on a daily basis. And um, so I think I'd like to address the first question then to, to Dustin that way. Um, as CIO of Manor, you must have been constantly, you must have been constantly sort of facing questions, do we buy it, do we build it, do we partner with someone, and, and to many extent, you know, the initiatives you've done uh, incorporate all three. So I was hoping you could talk a bit about what you did while CIO was Manor and, and how you sort of approached this sort of landscape uh, between public and private institutions and, and whether just to acquire resources to start your own. Sure. So, uh, so Manor, Texas is a very small community. I actually still live there today. 6,500 people, 34 employees, well now 33 since I'm gone. So it's a very, very small community. And one of the challenges that we had is how do we reach out to our constituents and, and leverage them and allow them to participate in dialogue and discussion and how do we create a smarter and intelligent city off of that? And the one challenge that we had was a lack of funds, a lack of budget. And uh, just like most cities, we had to cut back on a, on a regular basis, on an annual budget. And so we wanted to find a creative way to think outside of the box on really what a smart city was. 
And so when you think of a traditional intelligent city, you think in terms of infrastructure layers. You think about the technology, you think about the way that they're interconnected, you think about the business intelligence tools that are on top of that. But we had a different philosophy within the city of Maynard, and it was that there's another layer that's often missed from a smarter city. It's called the social layer. There is a group of experts that are average citizens that can help frame problems and that can help solve challenges. And so we set out with the Persuasive Technology Lab at Stanford University to craft a way to tap the wisdom of the crowds and our constituents and to build a network of experts that was far beyond the 34 employees that we had in our community. So we launched uh, what we called Maynard Labs at that point in time and allowed citizens to help submit ideas on what we could do better to increase efficiency and to cut costs as a community. And so the innovations and the ideas were driven from the bottom up, which when you look at sustainable change, it's bottoms up, it's local. It's not something that's pushed top down because anything that's top down doesn't typically stick well with constituents. And so we allowed them to help drive the change. We allowed them to plug into the process. And in doing so, we implemented their ideas. We transformed our agency and we were able to think outside of the box. Now part of that is not just with citizens and you, you alluded to where the private sector companies come in. And so we leveraged local universities, private companies that were local, private companies that were global. We worked with the university in, in Trentino, Italy on developing and incubating technologies that would make our city a smart city, but that would really solve relevant challenges that were faced by our constituents. And it was all leveraging this network of individuals that shared a common interest of creating social change on a mass scale. And, uh, and Maynard's philosophy is not just to solve problems on a localized setting, it's actually to address global challenges by creating a refined model of a local government. Interesting, well, uh, coming from that, uh, you know, Mark, IBM has done more than 2,000 consulting engagements to date, I know, on this. Because it's funny, I actually, there's a, IBM has a piece of news today. I don't know if anyone's seen it. Uh, IBM today announced the Intelligent Operations Center, basically a, a sort of distil distillation of the many consulting engagements that you've done to point. And so you've worked with 2,000 communities by now, like Manor, uh, in, in, and at various levels. We can see it all around us today. And I'm sort of curious, out of this, you know, what patterns of use? What is scalable? I mean, it's one thing to, you know, to cut water costs, water wastage by 20%. It's another thing to cut crime. All these fantastic benefits for individual communities. But what are the meta lessons that IBM has been learning out of this, like, a, you know, a manner has learned on its own? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I, I think a couple, of, a couple of parts to the answer. The first part is to, one of the meta lessons is to recognize that the landscape of solutions to potential problems, the big challenges that we face, is becoming much richer, much broader, and, and many more things are now more feasible because of some of the early trends that we um, identified in and which drove our Smarter Cities initiative. And those trends are both technology, but they're also societal trends. Uh, in the technology sense, they are, we hear about the instrumentation of the world, we hear about the interconnection of the world, and what we call the third eye, right, is the intelligence. And you mentioned the Intelligent Operations Center, for which thank you. Um, but the intelligence piece, instrumentation and interconnection are pretty clear, but the intelligence piece is really analytics. It's driving insight from ever more uh, diverse sources of data coming at us ever more quickly in larger and larger volumes. Now, whether those sources are... Uh, uh, infrastructural or systemic or they are actually societal, right? But it doesn't matter. Those are useful pieces of information. And the truth is that um, those three trends are enabling that richer landscape to open up. We can now think of doing things, creating solutions um, in many more places, in, in many more different ways than we could even a few years ago. Um, uh, and, and the reason I say those are not just technology trends, if you mirror those trends in, in what people's behavior is, is doing in society itself, you know, instrumentation means, uh, and we've heard this before, right, everybody has, or not everybody, but large proportions of, of the population have ever more increasing access to technology at a very simple, up to pretty complex capable level, right, and mobile devices and so on. The interconnection um, attribute is mirrored by the rise of the whole social networking, social media concept, um, bringing people together in new ways. And the intelligence aspect is the analytics is, is mirrored by the rise of what we all have now is, is incredible access to very serious compute power through the cloud, through you know, every time you, you, you do a search, or every time you post a video or a picture or whatever, you're actually using um, and taking advantage of invisibly um, very serious compute power. So those three elements kind of mirror each other kind of nicely. And, and, and I think that is the main lesson that we've learned as a meta lesson. And, and just to, to finish off the point of what smarter cities are doing in, in, in what you might say the, the repeatable patterns, um, three key things. First of all, 
um, to really understand that data question. What is the important data? Um, and where is it coming from today? Where could it come from in the future? Secondly, what analytics are actually going to give you value? Because not all of them do. Um, and thinking about it very holistically. This, you've heard the phrase system of systems this morning. And then the third thing is recognizing the need to create the right coalitions, which had nothing to do with technology, but the coalitions to enable those sorts of projects to happen. Well, I mean, well, speaking of coalitions, I mean, this is where Nick comes in with, with open plans. I mean, this is essentially, I, I'm curious to hear your, your approach to this, because, you know, while IBM has become a sort of major repository of this sort of knowledge of learning about intelligent cities, um, you know, IBM to some extent is still, of course, it is an organization and it is for profit. Um, you are working directly with mayors and open cities to basically have them share, to create sort of an open learning network with them and, and turn towards open source. Um, so the question I'd like to ask is, is sort of, you know, working with open source, are you just working with open source software? Is it an open source methodology? How, how open source should intelligent cities be throughout? What level of transparency, what level of collaboration are you working with? Sure, I thought uh, Judith mentioned this on the first panel, uh, the sort of the idea of open data as well as open systems and open platforms. Um, and with our work at Open Plans and Civic Commons, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, help foster a, a notion of openness in technology and information and sharing um, so that uh, you know, tools and information and patterns um, and solutions can be shared across cities. So it's not just about open source software in the, in the traditional sense, but it's sort of a broader notion of interconnectedness and sharing. And, and getting to your original question about how uh, sort of the, the various stakeholders and communities in civic technology fit together from the, the sort of independent civic hackers to the big, the big blue and the big companies to, to the governments. I mean, I think uh, our role at Open Plans and at Civic Commons as a nonprofit in this space is to help make some glue among all of these uh, stakeholders and uh, help sort of weave together a, a, a platform, if you will, for participation and interconnectedness um, and to help, uh, help amplify the efforts of the individuals um, and the citizens um, and also help those efforts uh, plug in to sort of official plug-in points, if you will, within government um, and within, within cities. Well, there's a question. I, I'm curious for each of you, take this in turn if you like, on sort of the role of the individual and individual in, innovation of this. I mean, intelligent cities is not exactly a simple concept to grasp. The tools are not there. This is not simply, you know, install an app for intelligent city on your phone and you're plugged into intelligent cities. Um, how much, you know, how much visual literacy do people need to engage in this? How much technology literacy? I mean, do we need to know how to code? to really understand when we're building an intelligent city and also to build solutions for it. Um, so I'm curious, you know, in your personal experiences, you know, working with individuals, how much, how much have they brought to the table and, and how much can they bring to the table? How much education do we need in this? How, you know, how much guidance do they need in the, in the city as a lab? Mark, do you want to take that first? Yeah, I, th I think it comes from, I, I think we've heard this before, the top-down the top element and the bottom-up element. And the top-down element for me is the notion that a city leadership collectively um, undertakes to provide some enablement of some kind. So, um, you know, these are not easy questions, as you say, but sorting out how people can access technology, what they access it with, where they get their broadband connectivity from, those are, you know, the bigger questions that are to do with the infrastructure of enablement. Mm -hmm. And conversely, at the bottom up end, I mean, we see every day organizations springing up, very small organizations initially, individuals, um, um, you know, uh, uh, these, these apps, uh, hack days and so on, um, coming out with real innovations. But they all depend on, um, first of all, that access to technology and connectivity. And secondly, uh, an openness on the part of the, the government institution concerned to provide the right information, to allow access to that information appropriately. And when those two things come together, it is extremely powerful. Um, I'll, I'll take a hack at that. I mean, I think there's sort of two sides, or at least two sides. Um, one of them that's particularly interesting is uh, a literacy and understanding of the technology that it takes and the policies it takes to deploy the smart city. Um, and that gets to, I think, a lot of our work in how do we figure this all out is all happening really, really fast. So uh, part of our job is to watch what different cities are doing and try and extract lessons from those the same way. I think that's what, what IBM and, and everybody who's participating in these forums is, is doing. So I think that's a really interesting uh, area of, of research and of interest. Um, on the citizen side and the sort of individual side, um, what's fascinating for me is that it's happening so naturally and so organically. Um, Susan Piedmont-Palladino on the first 
panel said uh, that this is all about provoking curiosity in individuals. And I actually think that's one of the most inspiring and interesting aspects of all this is that as the, the technology and information and data is deployed and made into tools that are sort of provide value for people on their day-to-day -day basis, it just naturally engages them in how the, the, the cities are working, how cities are working, how you're using your resources. Um, and I think that it's fascinating that you can uh, take a channel uh, starting with sort of personal utility and interest and, and channel that into sort of civic value. Um, and I see that as sort of a natural progression that probably doesn't require a whole lot of, of new kinds of literacy because it's, it's sort of generated by, driven by self-interest and, and personal motivations. So in the government side, I think the one thing that's lacking is education and the business value of the technology and the tool sets that need yeah. to be there. I mean, it got to the point where in Maynard I had to use a whiteboard to draw out. This is the inherent business value of leveraging this form of technology. This is the role of the citizen and their voice in the process and this is how it helps you. But it's that simplicity that's key with getting buy-in, especially from executives within government agencies. From the citizens, they're already ideating. They're already innovating in their own form and fashion. We just have to tap that. We have to collect it. We have to structure it. And the way we do it now in government, I've got a, a, an analogy that I use. I call it the megaphone syndrome. If we give citizens a megaphone now, what do they do with it? They're going to shout at us. They're going to yell insults. They're going to you know, <laughs> blast our elected officials. I mean, this is reality. You look at the, the traditional you know, newspaper websites. But if we structure the feedback and give them a clear purpose and give them rules of engagement and what's expected, the equation changes. Citizens start to construct intelligent systems. They start to create. They start to co-create. They start to form social networks. They start to solve problems together. And it's just by giving them a clear process of what's expected and making it very easy to understand. And unfortunately, sometimes it's very difficult to understand things. When I came into government, it took me a year just to learn really how government operates and take the textbook-based government and throw it out the window and say, no, this is, re this is a reality. And it's not something that is the same in every city. It's unique and it's case by case. And we have to make sure as government agencies that we help educate constituents on that. So in Maynard, it was, how do, where, do your tax, you know, where do your taxes go? And it was the fact that Maynard is not a federally funded city. Uh, cr contrary to popular belief, if you take a look at our city hall on Google Street View, you'll, you'll uh, see quite easy. Uh, but it was telling them, this is how we're funded. This is where your tax money goes. And doing very simple things that leveraged radio, that leveraged offline medias as well to allow them to understand how their city operated on a very fundamental level. Following that vein, I was hoping you could talk a bit about sort of what you know, the, the quick response solution you guys rolled out. Because I want to get to the notion of, you know, when discussing intelligent cities, there's this sort of, there's this sort of dichotomy I always find in covering this, um, where there is, of course, the grand vision, where we're imagining a massively censored up, interconnected globe, where there is an internet of things, and there's torrents of data, and everything is being analyzed by massive analytical engines. Uh, and then there's today, which is the prosaic truth of it, which is that there is a sort of piecemeal and mosaic of standards and technologies out there. And I'm, I'm sort of curious if you could talk a bit about the quick response and sort of how you got there and how you knit that together from what you had on hand. Because this is, to some extent, it, everything is sort of grassroots right now for a lot of communities that have, do not have the resources of an IBM assisting them, is that you basically have to sort of you know, pick up whatever's lying on the ground That's and right. start creating intelligent city. So in 2008, the city of Maynard was looking for a document management solution. And upon doing so, we decided instead of financing one, we were going to build one ourselves and leverage a local network of partners. So part of the process was looking for different barcode standards. And we found what's called the QR code, which is actually one of the program today, which is, which is great. And, uh, and when we saw that, we used it for our document management solution. We started to see other uses of this particular technology in the sense of putting it on buildings within the city, putting it on projects within the city. And so we did this in 2008, and I think everyone thought we were crazy at the time. But the premise was to bring another layer of intelligence to the physical world. So we all know that we construct projects, and we put signs out front that explain the details of capital construction projects within a community. But one of the things we wanted to do is make that information live. No project in government is ever on time or on budget. And so we wanted citizens to have the ability to scan projects and to find out information about that project at that moment in time. What is the current year-to-date expenditures for the project? What are the change orders associated with weather delays? And allow them to see all of that detail just by scanning the project, but augmenting the reality by giving them this other layer of, of transparency. Interesting. And so what is, you know, uh, what is the underlying technology of it to some extent? Was it all off the shelf? How much of that did you develop? Did you, you know, bring so, so the, the programmers first phase was 400 bucks. And the only, co <laughs> <laughs> the only cost, cost associated with the technology is the cost of the material that the QR code's on. QR codes are an open standard. So you can go to Google and you can create a QR code for yourself and you can print it out on a piece of paper. 
And so the only cost was the material itself. It requires that a citizen has a smartphone. However, we, we provided other means of uh, having data access, whether it was through Wi-Fi so they didn't have to have a data plan, or whether it was through texting to, uh, to receive the information back to their phone with what it was that was right there in front of them. Interesting. Well, Mark and Nick, I'm curious, you, for both of your, your perspectives on this, I mean, this sort of speaks to, you know, what, what the state of the art of the possible is now. And then, of course, we have a vision of where we want to go. And I'm curious, both of you, your thoughts on sort of what's missing between the, the, the current technology and the future technology in terms of standards, in terms of what's missing from the application stack, in terms of what needs to be written and how it's likely to be written. Because this is sort of the, I think, the biggest practical thing that's holding us back from the implementation of Intelligent City is that, is that we know we have a vision. We know where we want to go. We know the benefits are real. But we don't know what pieces, are, or perhaps we do know what pieces are missing. But in what order do we fill them in? How do we build them out um, you know, and, and create them from there? And, and what is the role of grassroots versus an IBM in those roles, standards bodies? I mean, there's a whole universe of technology that you know, I'm not sure that the people in this room really know about because well, this has been minutia for years. Yeah, if I can just, I'll, I'll take it from that sort of the IBM view and, or the, the, the big company view, if you like. The, um, I think one of, you've got to think about the role of an IBM is, or, a, or another company like us is not just to produce the technology and kind of show how it gets used, but to try to coalesce the ecosystem that's needed to, to really move forward. And often that is around standards, right? And somebody, I think it was an Accenture spokesman, once said, you know, standards are an agreement to stop innovating, mm -hmm. right? So there's a kind of a tension there, right? All the private sector companies like to innovate, blah, blah, blah. but at some point you have to get the message that, or we have to get the message, and I think we are, that we need some standards to make certain things work. To, let's say, if we want to have a building management system, talk to a public safety system so that in the case of an emergency, the building management system can help to evacuate people, right? Sim relatively simple ideas, but that re relies not just on the technology at either end, but on the standards that link that information, the protocols and so on, and also on the governance of how you are prepared to operate, the different agencies involved are prepared to operate. So standards at the technology level are important, but standards at the, uh, the level of governance and collaboration across boundaries in government, in government particularly, not exclusively, um, are really important too. And one example I'll point to that's very interesting right now is, is the Open 311 standard that's emerging that um, I think is going to become very useful, and not just in this country, the 311 kind of started here, but a lot of other cities around the world are looking at it. Um, the idea that you can, you, you know, you can, you can connect other devices, other systems um, from people's uh, smartphones into the 311 system to start to make it richer, to start to add value to it, to be able to learn things from the information that's built up, that is going to depend on the standards that allow that connectivity to happen. It's not just going to be, you know, 3 on one has to be a telephone with a voice through to a call taker, right? You've got, you've got to get the standards in place too. Another example, very briefly, is, is what's happening around the smart grid. I mean, we, we, we've spent a lot of time working with other companies, with academia, with um, uh, legislative bodies and others in building the GridWise coalition to try to figure out how all these disparate standards that exist out there right now can be brought together in the right way to enable some of the things that you know, the, the big vision talkers um, uh, speak about on a daily basis. It's really important. Um, sure, I'll take that. I mean, I think uh, I'll maybe flip the question back on you in, in that, or, or, or take it the other way, which is that uh, to some extent, the job right now is for us to listen and figure out what's missing. And I think this whole notion that uh, trends and standards are emerging and that now we have the ability to watch for those and listen for them is, uh, is really quite interesting. Uh, Open 3 on 1 is a project that we at Open Plans were involved in from the beginning when we noticed that several different cities were developing online 3 on 1 systems, but they were each doing them in a different way. So we didn't go into that with a top-down vision of the landscape of civic tech and said, oh, well, of course we need Open 3 on 1. We said, oh, it looks like five different cities are doing this, and so let's see if we can help them uh, develop an emerging standard. So that was sort of a, a bottom-up approach to creating a standard that you know, then can then become a platform. Um, just the other day, someone mentioned the idea of uh, open FOIA, right? So freedom of information requests are uh, one way in which the public tells the government what it's interested in. Um, you can learn a lot about what, uh, what's needed um, by looking at those types of requests. And so there's all sort of all this knowledge is emerging um, from, from, from different parts of the system. Um, 
And I guess that's, that's, that's what I want to say about that. Well, I mean, there, there is an in, in, implicit in this discussion of, of top down versus bottom up is ignoring the fact that at some point they basically meet in the middle, which is, you know, government, which is particularly municipal government. And, um, you know, what I find really interesting about the notion of an intelligent city and bringing technology into the city is basically you're then exposing the city, both its systems and city government, uh, to the pace of innovation itself. And I, I think we'd all agree that, you know, when you think of the word innovation, Government is not the word that springs mm -hmm. to mind here. And so um, the question is, how do you make government more innovative? I mean, you know, there's a cultural element too, and I'd like to hear Dustin's thought on this because, you know, technologists speak as technologists do, uh, you know, the public advocates uh, and activists speak in their own sort of language, in their own sort of culture, um, and then there is government in its own culture. How do you make the culture speak together? How do you teach the oldest dog new tricks? You have to show the business value of the technology. So, I mean, being a business major, it's all about what is the value this is going to bring to us and not the hype factor. It's not about social media and the fact, it's not about any of that. It's just about what's the inherent business value and how is this going to impact our agency and our efficiency. And so, you know, one of the strategies I use is you create a social norm for innovation within government. Uh, what's the traditional thing that government agencies do to deal with problems? You, you own a pair of them in your, uh, in your house. It's a pair of scissors. We cut back. We cut our budgets. And so one of the things that we can do instead of that is we can look at ways creatively to solve problems. So Maynard was faced with the same thing. It was either cut back or do something that was outside of the box, that was creative, that was innovative, and that leveraged a network outside of our network of experts. And in doing that, we opened ourselves up to amazing ideas that radically transformed the way that we did business. And it engaged the citizens. It made the process fun. We incentivized it. We allowed them to participate. So I think that education's one, but also thinking outside of the box and not accepting constraints for the box that we're given as the final answer. And I know it's a little bit more difficult when you get to higher levels of government to do that, but from a local level, from a municipal level, the city can be a lab, and it is a lab now, and you can look at many cities across the country, like San Francisco, that are doing things that are experimentative and that are really solving problems. I, I, if I may, I think another key thing is, well, two, two things. One, one is leadership is very important. If you have the right kind of leader or group of leaders emerging, then that is really very helpful in government. And, and secondly, I challenge somewhat the notion that government isn't innovative. I think that um, you know, in government you find a lot of different people who are innovative, who want to do new out-of-the-box things. I mean, one of them sitting right here. Um, uh, what you need to do is to try to find a way to, to let those people free and work together across the boundaries of their agencies, maybe um, at the city level or other levels, um, and enable them. And, and that does take leadership. And the, and, and the main job of leadership there is to figure out that it's okay for that to happen. That it really is a, a viable way for government to develop. And you look at, I mean, there are so many examples of that. One is, is what they did with Team Georgia, service delivery at the state level in Georgia, um, created a whole group of um, <clears throat> self-managed teams who did you know, root cause analysis of service problems, and they have made remarkable strides themselves in just in simply cutting down response times, figuring out where blockages were. Um, and, and the truth is there are innovators in government. And, and, and another piece of that, of course, is that as time moves on, you get younger, more tech-savvy people moving into government. And government suffers a little bit because sometimes you know, they can't pay the same kind of wages that the private sector pays. Still, to some extent, those people coming into government at the, at the junior levels are younger, more tech savvy, and they have good ideas. I'll add, uh, I'll add on to that that I mean, I think one of the biggest drivers of bringing innovation into government is that, in many cases, traditional development models have failed, right? And so, and budgets are tight, and that necessitates uh, exploring new approaches. I mean, all of Dustin's work in Maynard is about uh, trying something new because you have to. Um, and so getting back to the notion of this whole panel uh, of the city as a lab, I think is really an interesting idea. And I was thinking earlier, like, what, what happens in a lab? Um, well, two things happen. You uh, create experiments. And then from those experiments, you draw lessons, and you create new knowledge, and you spread that knowledge. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot more of that um, approach uh, happening and, uh, across cities and across government. And it's, and it's much more possible now than it was um, sort of with the rapid, uh, with the proliferation of sort of cloud-based applications, uh, with the, the speed of, of doing web development and sort of an agile process that is 
you know, starting in sort of startup land, um, I think that sort of vision of experimentation and, uh, is, 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 is actually happening. And so part of what we're trying to do at Civic Commons is sort of watch and draw those lessons and sort of connect the, the, the sort of learnings and research that are coming from all of those experiments and uh, make it usable. So that, to, when getting back to the prior question of sort of what's missing, um, I think that this uh, sort of communication uh, and layer and coordination layer uh, sort of to build on top of the learnings and experiments that are happening everywhere um, is, is a gap that we're trying to fill. Well, what, what is the role of government in this? I mean, from, from listening to the three of you, I mean, what I seem to hear is, is, the, is this seems to be the sort of philosophy in this that, you know, that basically uh, the government entities should really bring in, you know, should install the infrastructure and really bring that in for, from an IBM or from someone else and really create, a, in the lab metaphor, a sort of workbench for it. And then basically it should get out of the way and administer a lab full of citizens who are mm -hmm. then experimenting on that bench. I mean, is that sort of the, the vision? Because, I mean, it, it strikes me as, uh, this strikes me as very non-interventionist, I guess, by government here, that there is a sort of notion that if we, if we put the tools into people's hands, they will use them. And I, I you know... Because the flip side of that is, is, is I think sort of the pushback that Britain is seeing with sort of the big society here where David Cameron is trying to tell people, look, you can do this on your own, we will help you. And there is a sort of, you know, there is some sort of pushback being like, aren't you just basically cutting the services we've always had? Um, and I'm, I'm curious responses to that, or is that, you know, is that an American thing that we will roll up our sleeves if given the tools and build them ourselves? Or, or you know, what is the role of government in this? I think there are two interesting answers uh, to that. Uh, Technology is empowering lots of people, but two groups that are really helping government do their job. One are software developers who are building on top of data um, and platforms. And so there's this notion of uh, rethinking what we need to build as a government and how we're going to build it. So, uh, for instance, our work at Open Plans, we're working with the New York City Transit uh, to do real time bus information. Instead of building the whole uh, sort of apps and the whole infrastructure, we're saying, let's just open up the data. We'll provide some of those interfaces, but then let other people provide other interfaces. So it's not necessarily let's not, uh, let's not, let's provide less. It's just let's provide a different. Um, a different piece of it, and um, and 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 augment the sort of user-facing uh, tools with what other people can build, and that's like a really new idea. And then and then next to that is what can citizens do um, to help one another. And so in both cases, I think the major rethinking that's really interesting is about creating a generative platform that uh, enables. Uh, actors of all kinds to use it and connect with one another and have that activity augment what the government is actually doing itself. I, I think also the, the question about the role of government is very dependent on geography, on national, and on cultural attitudes and so on. If you look at what the Nordics would say about the role of government, it's very different from what the Americans would say. Um, and the Brits might be somewhere in between. I don't know, coming back from where I come from. Um, so, you know, that's, not, that's a question that's going to be out there for whatever purpose you're, you're looking at, the role of government. I think whichever end of that discussion a, a city lies on or a, or a region lies on, there are approaches that they can take. Everybody, whether you believe that you, know, you should be taxed at 80% and have everything provided by government, or whether you believe in the complete opposite of that, there are benefits to the sorts of things that we've been talking about. Both those approaches can, can drive benefit from thinking about their data, thinking about how they use their data, where they get it from, driving insight out of it to make decisions. So they're, they're kind of slightly orthogonal questions, I think. Both can be supported. And, and so in Maynard, I mean, just to, to kind of echo that, it was to create a foundational layer and an ecosystem and an environment that allowed citizens to build on top of it. So it wasn't what can we cut, it was what can we build to allow our citizens to add layers to it and to add information to it. So whether it was you know, open data through application development or whether it was just a, a governance process that allowed citizens to submit policy feedback, it was how can we enable their voice in the process, not what can we cut from them. And one of the other meta lessons, to use your phrase, that, that we've learned is that for many of these projects, particularly if you like the top end projects, not the, so much the bottom up ones, but for many of these projects, this, a lot of different stars have to align to make them possible. So, you know, we, we built a congestion charging system in Stockholm, which has had, in my view, dramatic effects. I mean, 25% reduction in traffic almost overnight, moving lots of people back onto public transport and so on. Um, but the stars were aligned for that to happen from the government, through community groups, through individuals, through pilots with citizens. Um, other cities in the world have looked at that solution and have signally been unable to, to align those stars. 
you know, uh, New York is one, Manchester is another in the UK, although I think New York might be looking at it again. But, um, but those things happen not just because they, the technology says they can happen, they happen because the role of government, the role of the private sector, the role of the different kinds of partners in that coalition have to all line up and their interests have to be respected. Well, that raises the question of whether, you know, whether, you know, social media uh, technologies and everything else, uh, you know, can transform the public participation in this process. Whether, I mean, because, you know, there is this whole notion, Ameri you know, we are terminal nimbyists in America now, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> Uh, but what's interesting is that we also maintain our, our total belief in the magic of technology to, you know, innovate our way out of any problem. You know, it is our ultimate sort of loophole. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, what resistance the three of you have seen in sort of community pushback to technology projects. This is not like building another highway. This is not like building a, you know, building a bridge to nowhere or anywhere. Um, this, is a, this is a thing where the benefits are, are in the cloud. Um, and so to some extent, there is, it's very difficult to, I guess, mount opposition. But, you know, are they more receptive to projects like these? Have you seen it, uh, you know, this sort of, you know, American belief in the power of technology when we've lost belief in planners like Robert Moses or lost our belief in public officials? Um, and can we galvanize uh, that, that belief to really make a difference? I think it's an interesting question. I mean, the parallel between physical infrastructure projects and technology infrastructure projects is clearly there. It was raised on the first panel. Um, the question of how do we know we're not sort of making some of the same mistakes that we've made in the past with this kind of infrastructure. Uh, in my personal experience, I haven't seen the sort of, you know, Jane Jacobs uh, opposition to mega tech projects, um, probably because they're just harder to see. Um, but I'm curious to what what you guys. I was going to say there has been there has been no you know cross Soho uh, expressway you know right. the equivalent right. of that in exactly. intelligent cities. Um, right. I I think and I hope that uh, you know one of the things we're learning and trying to explain our view of is that all the things I talked about that are leading up to making this stuff possible. Um, will drive insight that's at the intersection of disciplines, of the domains, that maybe we didn't have before. That when you look and you, and you suddenly find that, well, you know, where I actually station a police car, um, at which intersection, during which hours of the day, might have an impact on some educational outcomes of, of teenage kids. And suddenly you start to think about at that level and you look for parallels to that in the other domains, and, and I think it at least reduces the chance that you know, we're off solving the wrong problem, as someone said earlier. Um, so you know, that's, that's the hope for some of this, that as the physical and the digital world get kind of closer together um, and, and more linked, that that will enable those kinds of decisions to be made with, with better information, with more insight, drawn from more of the, of the community sources. Um, so, you know, I'm very hopeful that that's, that's happening, but it's going to be slow. It's going to rely on the things that you've mentioned before, standards and governance and so on. One last question before we open it up to questions from the audience and from Twitter, um, which is, I guess, directed towards Nick and Dustin, which is how do we guarantee inclusion into an intelligent city, particularly the inclusion of the poor, obviously. I mean, this is, we, we live in a world where basically the most sophisticated sensor we have and our interface for intelligent cities is a 200 to $400 smartphone. Um, and the interface du jour seems to be the iPad, which, you know, can cost $800. Um, and, you know, and while the cost of these will fall, there will be something else to replace them that developers will want to build for. How do we how do we lock in a sort of, you know, pro-poor inclusion into this uh, so that there's not, a, you know, the, the digital divide does not become an everyday life digital divide in everything around us? So in Maynard, I mean, there was always an offline component to the online services that we offered. That was a part of the strategy, that was a part of the policy, is to make sure that from an inclusion standpoint, we always had a way to access the data or the information, even if they didn't have access to a computer or, or similar device. The other notion is to use citizens as a form of sensors. So to allow them to respond and to tell us how they access information, and whether you do it from anal analytics or data that we extract. Uh, but the, the goal in Maynard was to analyze where the conversations were taking place, allow them to be channeled into the city, and to really create action off of that. So to do more than just listen and respond, but to, to have action. Great. I, I think there are two interesting ideas there. And clearly, that's like a, a very important question. One is that I like the notion that um, that technology is a force multiplier for ground troops and uh, community organizers and, and political people and you know, no matter what. And actually that uh, Harper Reed, who's the new CTO for the, I guess, the Obama campaign, mm -hmm. um, described his role uh, in the campaign as being the force multiplier for the existing uh, infrastructure. And I think that's an interesting way to thinking about technology. So it's not just about uh, direct uh, 
putting tools directly in people's hands, but it's also about amplifying the efforts of the existing sort of civic institutions that can use these things. Um, and then I think it's also important to remember that when we're talking about tech, we're not just talking about iPads and high tech. Uh, we're talking about cell phones and, and SMS and, uh, you know, Ushahidi and um, uh, the project from in Nairobi that was mentioned earlier, I can't remember what. So you're seeing, like, massive empowerment through technology that's not just, uh, you know, people checking stuff on their iPhones. And uh, the trajectory of technology for that is, is encouraging, okay? So from a price, performance, form factor type discussion, um, that's probably going to get better. We'll be, we'll be able to help to solve some of those um, questions. I think the, the inclusion thing also is about this notion that you know, once you open up to citizen involvement and citizen engagement through technology, you tend to get the same sort of self-selecting group, you know, who, the same people who would stand for eight hours in the rain at the town hall meeting come to the online forum. Um, and I think that's beginning to change. And, and, and we had a very interesting um, experience of that last year with the city of Coventry, again in the UK, I apologize where we put an, um, a major online jam together um, using some of our uh, uh, forum technology, content analytics technology, and so on. But the, apart from the outputs of that, what was really encouraging was the participation rate. The people of the city participated um, at rates that, that completely blew out the numbers that you typically see on internet forums. They blew out the ratio of over 50s to under 50s. Um, so I'm very encouraged by you know, what we see with when, we, when we do start to go and engage and try to make more accessible um, the, the relationship between citizen and government in cities. And my standard answer to that question also is that uh, there's a, uh, an analog participation gap that exists without the technology. Mm. And so uh, you know, that's one form of, uh, <laughs> of uh, exclusion and non-participation. That So the, the, the idealistic view is that the technology, the adoption of technology is, is expanding the universe of participation um, in different directions, but sort of to a greater sum total. I, I'm, I'm just, this is the oldest and grayest member of the panel here. I, I just want to wisest. Hop. Hark, no, no, not at all. But I, I hark back to the uh, a device called the Minitel in France, which I was conscious of in the mid to late 70s, and maybe it was introduced earlier. But basically, the government delivered a device to every household in the country that put people online in a very primitive way, compared to today. But the decision was a radical one. It was... Uh, uh, some people would say it wasn't a hugely successful experiment. Others say it was really successful in driving up awareness and accessibility to online service at a very early stage. Kind of interesting. But, did, but it also sort of failed because it was a closed system. I mean, that's sort of oh, accept, yes, that's certainly yeah, true. Except the failure. That's, that's interesting. It drove awareness of the actual existence of the system yeah. without the ability to build on it. Right, effectively. which is a different case today. Right? Yeah. We have those standards now. Well, while we wait for questions from the audience, uh, we have a question over Twitter from the, um, from the Planet of Civic Laboratories Report's lead author, Anthony Townsend, is out there lurking in the ether. His question is, is when does circulation and duplication of good civic technology become as commonplace as bike sharing, bus rapid transit, et cetera? Uh, so I guess I interpret that as, is when do we reach a tipping point? Because at one point, bike, you know, bike sharing was a radical thing done by maybe one European city, mm -hmm. and now it's sort of an accepted good. Chicago is going to do this. Uh, bus rapid transit went from Jaime Learners, you know, crusade to something that's very catching on. Um, so can we imagine, I guess, sort of how long will it take, given the acceleration of the technology, given the acceleration of our awareness of all these challenges, when do you think it will tip? When will this become, become a part of the common parlance, I guess, of, of urban planners' toolkits? Anyone want to hazard a guess on that? Six months. <laughs> <laughs> the optimist on the panel. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say it's, it's already starting. I mean, we're, we're starting up the, uh, the hill to the inflection point at that. So I would say six months to a year. I think there are also different um, change trajectories. Uh, you know, on the consumer level, it's going to change really, really, really fast. Um, you know, I didn't have a smartphone in my pocket two years ago, and now I can't live without it. And uh, sort of the original, the, back to the idea we were talking about at the beginning about how sort of people's own personal motivations are going to drive engagement, I think that's going to happen super duper duper fast. I think on the institutional side, it's going to take a, long, a, a little bit or a lot longer um, because you're talking about rebuilding different forms of uh, infrastructure, whether that's you know, procurement, a, a, a single given project, say, that a government goes out and buys, or sort of a longer term culture of uh, ha thinking about sort of approach. Those things are going to take longer, but I, I think the, I don't know if lava is the right 
um, metaphor, but you know, there's, there, there's different change, pace, the pace of change is happening at different, at different paces, um, and some of it's going to be super duper fast. Yeah, I think that institutional question is, is a longer term one um, than the, the consumer electronics, electronics side that we talked about. The analytics side, the, you know, once you have digital data, then the, the, the smartest algorithm that anybody has today or tomorrow can be used on it. So that's not a, a particular um, constraint. But the institutional acceptance of all of this is the slowest piece of the picture. Any questions from the audience? We have one in the back, please. I wonder if the, can you hear me? Uh, I wonder if the panelists could speak to public education, given that a large part of what cities do, and talk about some of the barriers and opportunities of using these type of platforms to engage citizens. So I'll speak to, uh, to Maynard as an example. So public education played a, a pivotal part. And actually, it was not just doing outreach through the existing channels like the newspaper, et cetera. It was going into the schools and teaching the students about this is the way your government operates. This is the way that you can get involved in the process. So when we first deployed our QR code program that I was talking about, we had very slow adoption rates. It was very early on. We went into the schools and we taught the students about how to use it. We had a, a series of different public meetings to bring people in so we could help them get the readers on their phone and teach them about the technology and also teach them how they could use it for their own business. And once we did that, once we showed them the business value of them using it as an individual, the technology adoption rates skyrocketed and they became a digital stonehenge for the city of Maynard. I, th I think um, this ties to one of the, the, the principles I have for our, what we're doing in the next phase of Smarter Cities is what I call bringing the best to the rest and uh, trying to figure out the business models that are enabled by things like cloud computing um, and shared services and so on that can be uh, uh, beneficial to the smallest of the municipalities, um, the smallest educational district. And um, one of the examples of that, actually, from our perspective, it, education is leading there because we, we have just literally announced, another thing we announced this week, or maybe Taylor last week, was this, what we call the Smarter Cloud for Education, which is putting that new business model into operation for educational institutions of sometimes very small sizes to try to give them access to the best practices, best applications, best approaches to how they manage their student bodies or how they do you know, the record keeping. I'm, I'm not an education expert, but, um, but that business model for, um, uh, for education is leading the way for us. Um, we, we will be talking more about cloud provision for municipalities in a broader set of areas as well. Um, but that best to the rest message is something we're going to focus on as we move out from the initial 2,000 that we talked about to you know, the next 5,000 or then the next 10,000 maybe. So. Question here in front, please. Uh, Tanya Washington, DC Office of Planning. I was hoping that you could give a few more details about um, the effort in Coventry to really engage citizens beyond what I frankly call the usual suspects. Um, not to use that in a negative term, yeah. but I know in, with our agency, there are certain stakeholders who are always very vocal, always very engaged. Mm -hmm. But the kind of work we do affects a much larger group than just those people. And so we're always trying to figure out ways to reach the, the kinds of folks who may not otherwise be yeah. interested in coming to a community meeting or, or that sort of thing. So I'm curious to hear about how, with that effort, they were able to reach a much broader range of folks. And also maybe as a corollary, how do we use this opportunity to get more direct feedback from a greater range of citizens and be able to communicate that to decision makers and, in our case, elected officials who ultimately make a lot of decisions about what we're able to do. Well, I'm sure you guys are going to talk about this too, but let me just make a quick comment about Coventry and the JAM um, concept. Um, Coventry was, was the first city we had done that with, but we have done JAMs before with um, communities of various kinds. And in one case, um, uh, the World Urban Forum a few years ago, we did a, a jam in, in the run-up to that to try to drive the agenda out uh, of what that forum should talk about. And so we were doing things like taking um, buses around villages in South Africa um, with facilitators to get people to um, participate, even if they'd never seen a computer before, but to have conversations which were then translated into the whole um, jam picture. Um, and, and so in Coventry, it wasn't quite um, you know, as dramatic as that sounds, but it was a, certainly a, a, an outcome of some very serious planning before the jam, which is, by the way, a, a very fixed period of time, 72-hour, certain set of topics, 
um, time constrained, content constrained discussion. It, it could be more, it could be less, but for that purpose. Uh, and so there's a certain degree of planning that goes into how you solve that very problem of the, the, the as you put it, I think very well, the usual suspects, because they do exist. Um, but but uh, the participation rates, and I'd be happy to send you some material on that, were dramatically different from um, the usual suspects in the town hall meetings. And, and I can't explain why, except to say that it was planned well, the outreach was performed, um, and in this case, at least, it seemed to work. I'll, I'll say a couple things. I mean, I think it, these are really fascinating questions. On the issue of how do you build engagement, I, I think it's going to be new ways. It's not just about getting more people to come to a public meeting. We're going to see ha engagement happening in different places in smaller ways, uh, more ubiquitously. Um, and I, I, there are two examples I think are interesting. I mean, one is I think you build engagement on top of personal utility. So my example is I'm riding the bus. I, I use my phone to find out when the bus is coming. And then the agency can then ask me to answer a question about how the system is working for them, right? So you can build engagement into personal utility tasks and, and little interactions that happen throughout the system. Um, the issue of game mechanics was also mentioned uh, earlier on. Uh, there's an interesting project out of Boston called um, the Community Planet. Uh, where they're building a, a game that, that walks people through the city and asks them questions about how it works, all as a build-up to the public meeting. The, the idea being that you don't want the public meeting to be the time for people's first chance to, to connect or, or learn. And if you can build up that knowledge and understanding and questions uh, over time, that's more meaningful. Um, and then on the issue of how do you channel feedback in more meaningful ways, um, I, the, the idea that I think is most interesting is that people are saying things and it's not just about getting them to say them in your forum, so come to my public meeting. It's about how do we listen to people where they're already talking. Um, Clay Johnson calls this uh, giving government better headphones. Um, uh, there's a, a group called Expert Labs building an application called ThinkUp, which uh, lets you listen to Twitter and, and sort of channel it and, and so on. And so this idea of listening better and in different places in more ways all the time um, I think is quite interesting. Getting back to the original question about where, where is their pushback, or one of the questions about where there's pushback, um, one thing that I, I think I should have mentioned is just, and it was mentioned earlier, is the question of privacy. I think that's the area where we're, if we're not already seeing it, we're going to start seeing it um, because government's going to be listening better in order to do good things, but also that raises sort of a creepy specter. We have time for one last question, please, in the back. That would be you. Um, I'm, I'm a little confused because if you talk to Walmart or you talk to home builders, they're going to say they build a product because people buy it, and that's responsiveness. So the issue of data and public input, doesn't it put more responsibility on staff in cities? and change the makeup of staff and possibly expand government to be able to use the information usefully? An interesting question of scale. It is, it, it, digital scalability implies that we can basically scale up participation without human intervention. Is this the case, or is there an unintended consequence? Anyone? So I, can, I mean, I can speak from Maynor as an example. The, the public's input actually allowed us to reduce the amount of wait times and, and the loads that were put on existing employees because we distributed the workload. So instead of constituents saying, hey, you know, there's a pothole right here somewhere in this general area, now go send a team out there to find it, they were able to use their smartphone, take a picture of it, geotag, vote on their least favorite pothole, and prioritize our response on that. So it actually distributed the workload <laughs> to the constituents, <laughs> thus reducing the burden on the agency itself. I, I can't. Oh, yeah, so please speak Sorry, closer. that's that's low-paying work. That's like let let's find it and we'll fix it. It's the actual idea of framing policy sure. that responds that I'm yeah, interested. Some thoughts in. on this. I, I think that's interesting. Oh, sorry. We're working uh, right now with the New York City Department of Transportation to help them build tools to gather feedback from their constituents. And um, one of the, the biggest questions was, how are we going to staff this? Because now we're going to get all these comments, and what are we going to do with it? And it's, it's a, a sort of a parallel question to uh, now that we're building, if we're just building uh, data platforms, we have to manage new communities of developers. And how do we staff that? And all of these things point to shifts in staffing of government, for sure. Um, I like Dustin's answer that you're and you're building a platform for people to help answer each other's questions and build their own tools. And so uh, my idealistic answer is that hopefully it's not about just expanding you know, uh, linearly staff uh, as, uh, and the idea that 
you're getting a much bigger bang for your buck as you invest, but it's certainly a change in how, in how staffing it, is set And up. to kind of echo over that one second, we, uh, we crowdsourced a master plan for a county, uh, Hartford County, Maryland, 233,000 people. Crowdsourced it, so instead of a traditional public meeting, which they still had those, we allowed individuals in the community to submit their feedback for the master land use plan for 2012. And we allowed the citizens of the county to vet the ideas first. So they were the first filter of the feedback and then there were clear feedback loops built into an enterprise process on top of that. So they allowed the crowd to vet it. It didn't increase any workload from the county's part. It distributed and they got amazing participation from those people that don't normally want to show up to the meeting late at night. So that was one way that, uh, that we structure that type of participation. I, I think if I may, the, 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 a couple of points. Um, first of all, I, I don't want you to think that I believe that technology can magically solve everything. But in the case of what I think the question is talking about is it, it can certainly help. The idea is not necessarily to do more with less, but to do more better with maybe the same and maybe less over time or maybe more over time in some cases, right? But an example of how, um, you know, you can use technology to at least affect that staffing question. Uh, maybe some of you saw the Watson machine playing Jeopardy, right? Now, Watson is a very deep analytics capability, which we're thinking about other app um, applications of Watson other than just being able to play a game show. Um, and one of them is clearly in um, medical uh, diagnoses and so on and supporting physicians in that role. One of them that I'm thinking about right now is what, what Watson could do in triaging 311 calls um, and trying to gather information from what the questions are that people are actually asking of cities um, and at least come up with, you know, not, not the be all and end all answer or the response, but a capability that will help the existing staff to do that job smarter. I think what's interesting about the question and your answer, Mark, is that uh, you could at once see all of this technology greatly expanding the required capacity of staff inside governments and also greatly reducing it and cutting jobs. And so you could sort of imagine a doomsday scenario in both directions. Yeah. I'm not a fan of doomsday. Me neither. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think any of us are. Well, on that light note, um, <laughs> please thank our panelists. I'd like to thank our panelists for our very smart panelists. We'll steal Rick's joke again.